Hillary has been lengthening her excuses as to why uh, she lost the election. She didn't really lose the election. It was stolen from her uh, by, I think it's up to 24 different excuses she has now. Number 24 is content farms in Macedonia. And uh, as I said, uh, my grandfather was a a Macedonian content farmer. And uh, we often think about, you know, gathering on the porch and recalling the old days on the Macedonian. I never thought, he never thought that the old content farmers he left behind in Macedonia would one day steal the U.S. presidential election. And welcome to the Macedonian Content Farmers podcast, another exciting episode, episode 15. My name is Jason Miko, coming to you from the snow-covered mountains in Oro Valley, Arizona. And this is Svet and Chulimanov. We also have snow-covered mountains here in Macedonia. It's actually, uh, temperatures have dipped a lot uh, these past few days, but I guess it's nothing as interesting as having snow in the desert, right? <laughs> well, that's true, and, and I appreciate We're recording this on Saturday um, February 23, uh, I got up early this morning. When I say early on a Saturday, I mean 8 a.m. We had this major winter storm come through all of Arizona yesterday. I mean, anytime Arizona makes the national news because of weather, you know something's going on. Flagstaff, Arizona, uh, where I spent a year and a half going to school, it sits at 7,000 feet elevation. That's what, I don't know, 2,300 meters or something like that, 2,400 meters. They got three feet, a meter of snow, shattered the one-day record. Here in in Oro Valley, the Catalina Mountains, actually throughout Tucson, Oro Valley, it was snowing during the day yesterday. It wasn't sticking because it had rained so much. But but right now I look out my windows and my mountains, as I call them, Push Peak and Push Ridge, are just covered with snow and it is and it's bright and sunny it's just gorgeous it's uh is it total it's one of, collapse like it happens in georgia when it snows or it just isn't <laughs> enough to to obstruct the roads or anything well look uh, you, my fellow two sons don't know how to drive when it rains let alone yeah. snows so uh, a lot of people yeah a lot of people just stay home and uh and they go out and they you know they break the internet by taking pictures and post them which is what i was doing this morning i went out it was it was bloody cold it was it was probably 29 degrees Fahrenheit, so that's what, minus one, minus two Celsius uh, as I was tromping through the, the trailheads uh, trying to get pictures, and I put them on Facebook and whatnot. But um, anyway, all that to set the stage uh, for another exciting episode, episode 15 of the Mastering Content Farmers podcast, and as always, plenty to talk about. Uh, I think, you know, as we get into this, this uh, I call it round two. Mm-hmm. of our Greek friends attempting to deny the identity of the Macedonian people. Uh, round one was the Republic of Macedonia, uh, which is what most of the world called it, and most of the world called the people Macedonians, the language Macedonian. They still do. But now that we're in this new world, quote-unquote, of the Prespa Agreement, brave new world. the Greeks, brave new world, yeah, the Greeks, of course, are going to, because the Greeks, and this is the fundamental issue, in my opinion, is is not the name or things like that, it's the identity, and the Greeks have always denied that the Macedonians exist, the Macedonian language exists, that the Macedonians exist in Greece, in Macedonia, in Bulgaria, everywhere else, and and that, to them, is their holy grail. They want to get the world to agree with them. That none of this exists, and so I see that the the government of Greece, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, issued its own guidelines on mm-hmm. how to refer to the Macedonians, and then the Macedonian government issued new media guidelines and FAQs, facts on how to uh, refer to the Macedonians, the language, the adjective, and the use of this. Um, what what have you uh, been uh, observing over there on this? Yeah, this is going to be the glorious part of the dispute because uh, in the Greek, uh, in the reports I saw from the Greek uh, uh, FAQ, they do not insist on that we use the North Macedonian adjective, even though it will mm. naturally flow from the name like North Koreans or Western German industry or military or, or something you would like to or West Vir- or West Virginians or yeah. North Dakota. The better of the two Virginias <laughs> is of recent. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> the, both, both we'll, ignore what's, we'll ignore what's going on with race issues and sexual assault issues in Virginia right now. No, both countries have, have lived for uh, in for over a year are going down the toilet. This is incredible. I'm, <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm absolutely homeless now. Uh, so uh, they're not going to. They do not insist that we use the North Macedonian name, but adjective. But they do not grant us the use of the Macedonian adjective. Meanwhile, on right. the other hand, in the 
Macedonian guidelines from the Macedonian Foreign Ministry, they claim very defiantly, very specifically, that we have the right to use the adjective uh, Macedonian everywhere, especially in ethnic identitarian issues, except that right. we cannot use it for government institutions. So we're supposed to say right. the, the Foreign Minister of North Macedonia was discussing right. Macedonian issues, Macedonian cuisine, Macedonian food, Macedonian right. history, and the Greeks are going to go ballistic uh, over this. They did of not course. sign up for this. And this right. comes back to Zayev speaking out of both hands of his mouth when he claimed to the Greeks, yes, we acknowledge that Macedonian means citizenship only. And even this is further qualified by an addition of a citizen of the Republic of North Macedonia. But then he would turn around and tell Macedonians, the Greeks accepted that we have the right to our own, own national identity for the first time ever. So this is going to turn around and uh, bite him on the ass. Right. Well, I wrote an article about this this past summer after the Prespa Agreement came out. Of the Republic of North Macedonia is not an adjective. Yeah. An adjective, the dictionary definition of an adjective is a single word. And of the Republic of North Macedonia is six words. That is not an adjective. Yeah. And so <laughs> you're absolutely right. The two sides are going to – well, what, what, what amazes me, Svetin, is that the government of Macedonia felt a need to issue these in the first place. So if it felt the need to issue these, my question is why? Well, I think we know the reason for that is because we're starting to see media articles and individuals and others say these things, North Macedonian uh, or Northern Macedonian, uh, and, and, and that's why they issue these. Now, that's why I'm, I'm calling this round two because, the, as you said, the Greeks are saying one thing, the Macedonians are saying another thing. Who's going to prevail in the the war, the war of the adjectives? Yeah. No, it's clear. I mean, the uh, Macedonian side is completely in the back seat here. They do not have any uh, uh, say or input in, into all of this. But the, uh, it's so endearing with this these guidelines. They're actually being, you know, almost in your face to the Greeks. They're being uppity in this case, and it's going yeah. to end very badly for them. They're going to get shut down very quickly on this, I imagine, and. Yeah. Uh, Unless they intend, you know, with the Greeks to, with the current leftist government to leave, leave this as the hot potato for the next conservative Greek government following the backlash which is coming there and hopefully here as well. Yeah. Maybe I mean, what's going to happen? Time. It's going to be your classic Monty Python skit when, when, especially when new democracy gets into power and on the war of the adjectives here, it's the Greeks are going to say, no, I should, it'll, uh, a you a session accord you got there, governor. Be a shame if something happened to it, eh? Uh, and they're gonna they're going to they're gonna you know essentially make demands of the Macedonian government on these issues, and the government is gonna cave as long as it's I have at least. Yeah, for a long time my concession on the name issue, which I was proposed, was that we set up something like this, uh, in which both the Macedonian embassy in whichever country in the world and the Greek embassy would jointly send a letter to let's say the New York Times if they report on say Macedonian wine, and asking them b both countries. Uh, guys, you mentioned you, said you used Macedonian to refer to the wines made in the Republic of Macedonia. Could you kindly, uh, you know, add an addendum to the article say, clarifying that uh, these are wines produced in the Republic of Macedonia, while there is uh, a Greek region uh, going by the same name where they can also produce wines, which they would refer to as Macedonian wines, so don't get them confused. You know, this would be... This would have resolved 90% right. of, of the name issue. The rest, uh, you know, of the yeah. uh, face value complaints of the name issue. The actual, as you said yeah. before, the actual content of the name issue is not the name itself, but it's the sovereignty of Macedonia. And the name is used mm -hmm. to, uh, to annul, to uh, undermine Macedonia's sovereignty, because if a neighboring country is strong enough to tell you that you're supposed to change your name domestically within your own country, you are no longer the owner, you are no longer the sovereign of this country. This other, this other country is. Greece is, in our case. And once we gave up on our sovereignty right. on a symbolic issue, there is no end of concessions we are supposed to make to Bulgaria, to the Albanian minority here, to wh whichever diplomat is sent our way, to, to everybody. Yeah, and until you got somebody that stands up and says Dosta. So, um, you know, you mentioned, you, you were talking about wines there a minute ago, and, and I see as I go through the, the uh, Q&As and the, um, uh, the guide, media guidelines and whatnot, you know, issues, uh, uh, and this is for a future podcast, of course, commercial issues mm -hmm. and, um, you know, wines made in Macedonia and other thing, other products and business names, etc. That's a whole nother 
uh, uh, issue that is going to create um, problems between the two countries. And that is, that's going to come up sooner rather than later. And we know that the Greeks are already plotting and planning uh, what they yeah, sure. are going to be demanding. So, sure, well, uh, we yeah. can take a short break maybe here after this grammar lesson and sovereignty lesson. And well, actually, yes, we, yes. Let's take a short break after discussing adjectives and let's come back and discuss adverbs. <laughs> we'll be right back. There's all these stories about, you know, guys over in Macedonia who are running these fake news sites. And welcome back to the Macedonian Content Farmers podcast. We were discussing uh, grammar adjectives before and uh, now we're going uh, to adverbs. We're going to talk about adverbs. Look at what you can learn on this podcast, people. Uh, You're being <laughs> Svetin, our, our, our friend uh, Borian Jovanovsky, uh, a journalist, a commentator, analyst uh, in Macedonia, has been around for a long time. Used to work for um, our friend President Boris Trajkovsky, um, uh, and I know we're coming up on the 15th anniversary of his passing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I think Boris would be greatly disappointed in Borian today. Borian, he, and he, Steve he, and Nikolai. And yeah, all of those guys, yes, but... But his tweet, um, I want to read his tweet. It was in response to something that uh, Nikola Dimitrov tweeted out. And he wrote, uh, officially, we still Macedonians speaking our native Macedonian <laughs> language. So, of course, it should have been officially, we are still Macedonians speaking our native Macedonian language. Okay, fine. So the, the issue here is the word still. <laughs> still is used in this case as an adverb. And here's the dictionary def definition. Quote used for saying that a situation continues to exist up to and including a particular time, especially when this seems surprising, or, quote, used for emphasizing that a particular situation has not completely ended or changed. So yes, so at the present time, we are still officially Macedonian speaking our native Macedonian language up to and including the present time. But that could change in the future and it's unfortunately that he had to use that adverb uh, and it's almost as if he's anticipating that in the future and it's kind of funny that he tweeted that out two or three days ago and then the government of Macedonia put out these media guidelines and the Q&A's uh, on the Macedonians and the Macedonian language etc um, and uh, you know it's, it's like I said it's almost as if he's anticipating there's going to be a time soon when we are no longer still Macedonian yeah. speaking our native Macedonian language. Yeah, I mean, uh, Borian, if, if you look into the dictionary, uh, look for a definition of uh, these urban, effect uh, post-national Macedonian leftist elites, there is a picture of him there. He's not a Macedonian. His uh, family, they were Yugoslavs. They uh, committed themselves to the building of the communist Yugoslav uh, state and including ident the Yugoslav identity. And... Yeah. Uh, now, after having caught the Brussels bug, having lived there for so long, having been paid by the European Union for so long, they do not consider, they're not Macedonians, they do not, I, I don't know in what, what way they consider themselves Macedonians, they're citizens of the world or Europeans yes. or, or whatever, yes. they live for whoever pays them, uh, yep. currently it's Brussels, previously it was the Yugoslav regime, uh, you know, his father was in the, uh, uh, actually recently he was out at this, uh, during the illustration process, it was revealed that he was actually uh, from the position of a person who could actually help dissidents in Macedonia uh, in front of international European organizations who fight for human rights uh, and who are calling out communist countries like Yugoslavia for human rights abuses. He was actually uh, co coordinating with the Yugoslav communist police on how to undermine the case for Dragan Bogdanovsky, the Macedonian dissident uh, and national hero. So uh, they're human rights violators. They serve the communist regime. They now serve uh, this European regime, the EU regime. They're not Macedonians. And uh, this is just posturing, trying to cover up for his friend and potential presidential uh, nominee, uh, uh, Nikola Dimitrov, who would, by the way, be the third 
uh, SDSM presidential candidate in a row who came out of Boris Trykovsky's uh, office after Lyubomir Ferchkovsky, Steva Pendarovsky, and now Nikola Dimitrov, which is... Wow, is, now, is, that's something. a good point now. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Is is uh, let's let's kind of shift gears here a little bit. Um, so, is Nikola the uh, official uh, candidate, or is that just the he's still in the top four or five armor to be? Well, not yet, but it's widely assumed that he will be. Hmm, interesting. Uh, of course, Vomero has chosen their candidate. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't you tell us about Gordana? Yeah, uh, Professor Gordana Silanovska, she's a, a university law professor. She's actually specialized in this area of constitutional law, which was, you know, the most abused and violated uh, in order to get us to the PRESPA Accord. She, she uh, wrote a 50 pages long uh, dissertation assaulting everything that, which is wrong with the PRESPA Treaty, and there is a lot of it wrong there, uh, which is actually, uh, yep. you know, fascinating to, to read through. Um, and she's, uh, she was elected with a very large majority in the Vimera uh, Convention in Struga. This happened on the day we were recording the past podcast, so this is the first time we were right. mentioning this. Uh, she got more votes than Vladimir Djurchev, who was the second most serious runner-up. And basically, Vimera chose uh, a non-partisan uh, person instead of a party loyalist like uh, uh, Djurchev. Uh, Djurchev is a true conservative here. Silanovska yep. was... Uh, in uh, the first SDSM government in the early 90s. Uh, uh, so this, obviously, a lot of people, uh, people raised this against her. And she was also involved in the uh, color revolution protest in the er early stage, before it became apparent uh, what their ultimate goal is. I hope that she honestly believed that she's fighting for, you know, it, the issue at the, of, of the day was improvements in the higher yep. education or something. And she... All right pulled herself out of it very quickly after it became apparent what's going to happen once SDSM assumed power in the country. Uh, so um, this is actually Vimera very caval cavalierly offering a hand to the protesters who rallied against them, to the non-partisan, to the independent voters. They're saying they can rise above their you know, narrow political interests and go with a person who um, could appeal to all sides and who would be a strong protector of Macedonian sovereignty and constitutional uh, and the constitution and uh, international law, which is being violated in this uh, agreement as well. Today she collected uh, 10,000 uh, signatures. Uh, she, she would presumably have the necessary votes in parliament, even though the way women are members of parliament and being, uh, are being arrested every week, mm -hmm. that might even be questionable, but she would likely have had the needed votes in Parliament, but she opted to collect 10,000 signatures from citizens, and she did this in a matter of hours today, which also shows some enthusiasm and popular support as well. Uh, yeah, absolutely, and I want to I want to talk about the beating up of, of the Vomero folks in prison in a minute and things like that, but two points on, on, on Gordana. Um, number one, um, the fact that, that she supported the so-called color, colorful revolutionaries early on, but then saw that where, the direction that was going in and reversed her herself that's that's to me that's a good sign because mm -hmm. she realized uh that that was not the right direction for the country uh you know one of the hallmarks of a conservative is the ability to be you know to be open to correction and to admit you're wrong and i'm happy uh, to admit if i'm wrong on something and i'm always open to correction uh and so it sounds like uh she saw the error of her ways and she changed and that's good number two is that this is the first um female candidate of either one of the two parties in the history of macedonia isn't yeah. that is that correct yeah that's okay now so that's so that's number that's one but here's here's a good question let's take bets okay i'm a betting man um uh, will the feminists in macedonia of whatever political persuasion uh will the feminists in the region applaud her candidacy and support it. Yeah, I, I doubt it. <laughs> yeah. Correct. Alex, I'll take I doubt it for 400. <laughs> now, some of the most outspoken the, uh, the le feminists here who would tear your new one if you, uh, you know, for perceived wanting to have the woman in the kitchen or something like that, they were actually attacking uh, uh, Gordana as, as soon as she was elected as being too old, uh, looking like a grandmother, not like, you know, uh, the Croatian... Uh, president, you know, this uh, good-looking blonde. So, you know, this was... Uh, th their feminism was apparently skin deep. And there was another uh, horrible uh, 
you know, they're going to play very, very dirty against her. Uh, of course. She was uh, elected uh, by the Vimera Convention a few days after this horrible bus crash. And remember, uh, I mentioned, we mentioned then that there was this horrible conspiracy theories that Russia was behind the bus crash, etc. Yes. There was another uh, horrible uh, comment, uh, a phony outrage on uh, Facebook and Twitter over Bilena Vankovska, a largely leftist professor who is also not being uh, brainwashed on the name issue, who also protested against Vimera, but then uh, once it became clear what the end game is, she turned on ASDSM. So she made a comment shortly after the crash, which happened uh, at the site of the uh, 2001 uh, ambush of Albanian terrorists of a, Macedonia, uh, a convoy of Macedonian army reservists, I in which 10 soldiers it. were killed in Karpalak. Yep. And Vankovska yep. said, this is a tragedy and it's ironic, Karpalak again, which is, you know, <clears throat> like a comment you would make, I guess, if something horrible happens at, uh, I guess, at... Uh, uh, ground zero again, like you would say, oh yeah. no, not again, not again here. Uh, here we go again, something like this. Um, and then there was this completely drummed up fake outrage against Vankovska, uh, by Albanians mostly, which, you know, looks especially intimidating because Albanians on social media do not think twice about making a threat, I'm going to find you, I'm going to, and, you know, uh, do this and that to, your, to you. Uh, they said, you're gloating yeah. because... Uh, the victims were Albanians, not all of them, you know, uh, about a third were Macedonians, two thirds were Albanians. Nothing in the comment implies that she meant this. But what, what, what was the point was made apparent a few days later when Silanovska was elected uh, a presidential candidate and all the Albanian media outlets uh, had the same story the same evening, within minutes after she was elected. Oh, look, uh, Vimero, this conservative Macedonian nationalist party, they elected Vankovska's friend as a presidential nominee. And remember how Vankovska gloated about dead Albanians? Well, which Albanian, no, no Albanian can vote about, uh, can vote for Silanovska now. And this was the story they, they, they ran with. So this tells you, and you know, the, the Vankovska outrage happened within hours after the crash. So this tells you that while the bodies were still being taken out of the bus, the PR department of the Macedonian government which is actually, you know, their only way to win elections is to drum up outrage among Albanians against Vimera and keep them in line. And they were saying, okay, how can we use this? How can we turn this into our political advantage, this bus crash? Okay, we, we pin this on the very likely Vimera presidential candidate through a friend of hers and a supporter of hers who really didn't say anything so outrageous after all. That is just absolutely appalling and... These, these are loathsome people, to be honest with you. They have a uh, Media Matters for America advisor, Eric Burns, in the country, and this is this has his fingerprints all over it. Is he still there? Yeah. Seriously, is he is, is he there based permanently, like uh, yeah, David yeah, Stevenson, yeah. or yes, is he... Yes, uh, yes, he's Zayef's uh, advisor. He was recently, you know, like, uh, gloating after Zayef met with, David, with Joe Biden, saying, oh, my two best-loved political idols in my lifetime... Zayef and Joe Biden. Imagine what uh, miserable life you must have led if you count Zayef and Joe Biden as your political uh, <laughs> load stars. Oh, well, yeah. Crazy Uncle Joe. I think he's going to run here no, uh, he's for president, but that's another... Uh, that's, he's, not far, he's not far lefty enough for the rest of the, uh, the Democrats. <laughs> um Let's let's move. I want to move back to um, you know some of the some of the news about what's going on. There's more arrests going on of uh, members of parliament from Vomero. There's the beating up of the former ministers, Vomero ministers who are in prison. Um, they're going to try and strip uh, immunity uh, from uh, some more parliament members. Bring us up to date on what's going on there. Well, there were a series of, of arrests. Uh, it began with uh, a complete attack on the literally the entire lineup of the Socialist Party. Uh, three former agriculture ministers uh, from the Socialist Party were uh, uh, targeted, including one who steadfastly refused to vote to change the name uh, in the parliament and who was arrested for as a terrorist in the parliament uh, incident. And now he was again uh, targeted for alleged corruption, which is, you know, complete bullshit. The Socialist Party runs the Seattle television and uh, they were clearly attacked, uh, you know, their party leader is the owner of the television, 
and they were clearly attacked over this. Avomer, a deputy minister, was also dragged in this. And then the next week, uh, police raided uh, former parliament speaker Trajko Vedanovsky, uh, who was speaker, he was deposed literally by the parliament incident in Bayes, DSM and Dewey yeah. uh, after, you know, the uh, yeah. US State Department and uh, the EU acknowledged this former terrorist as parliament speaker instead of uh, Vedanovsky. So he was mm -hmm. charged. He still has immunity, but it's being fast-tracked to parliament, the process to remove it, you know, to rescind his immunity. So he'll probably be sent to prison is, is that, in a few days. Does that take 61 votes or two-thirds? Uh, 61. Uh, but even if it was oh, two-thirds, okay. I guess they would have it. And then, yeah. uh, and then two other uh, former government ministers, Milena Kievsky and Spiro Ristovsky, they were also arrested. They're all being charged again as terrorists in this parliament incident, which the SDSM government is milking, milking this case for everything it's got because they use this to arrest uh, uh, f uh, six, I believe, Vimera members of parliament, three of whom <laughs> broke and decided to vote in favor of the new name. One who didn't break, like uh, Lubcho Dimovsky, he was, as I said, rearrested again. So this is basically, this case is being used for every person you don't like in the country. Uh, this is being pinned, uh, this case is being pinned on you, including, uh, again, they're charging Gruevsky as well. Uh, they're saying that he used media outlets to call the people to protest. And now this would actually, as he noted, uh, this would apply to literally every party leader in Macedonia. If the right. protest eventually goes, uh, turns out violent, as it did in this case, after the, the crowd was provoked by the by SDSM and Dewey by their irregular vote in parliament. So they arrested uh, Yanakievsky and uh, again for the third time, I believe, and Ristovsky for the first time. They sent them to the Shutka prison on Wednesday. And the next day they were attacked in the prison by a group of Albanian terrorists from the 2015 attack on Kumanova, the Kumanova group which killed eight right. Macedonian uh, police officers uh, when they took the city uh, uh, by siege and uh, they lost 10 of their yeah. own in the, in the bloodbath, yep. which ensued. Yep. And um, so basically the SDSM government is picking up mm -hmm. Vimer officials and they're literally threatening them. We're going to send you to Shutka where you'll be beaten up and killed by Albanian terrorists we have there who have carte blanche to do whatever they want to you because the evening after the incident, the government, uh, Zaev and uh, his party, they're claiming that Vimera staged this attack in the prison. So they're accusing the victim, that Vimera people are uh, themselves provoking the Albanian terrorists, that a minister of the gov uh, government minister, uh, a person of high standing in society, uh, would provoke a literal terrorist in a prison yard knowing that nobody will jump to his protection. All right. This is ludicrous. Well, yes. Okay. So let's, let's just take a pause right there. Uh, I want to throw in the whole issue of nepotism, which is going on in the government of Macedonia right now amongst Citizen and Dewey and, and, and some of the other parties that are hiring their relatives. Uh, I know the prime minister came out the other day and said that they've got to step down. Some did, some didn't. But we know that the nepotism is going to continue. So you take all of this collectively. You take the continued arrest. You can t you take the beating up of former Vomero uh, ministers who are imprisoned. You take the, the, the stripping of immunity. You take the nepotism. All of these things. And here we are coming up on, um, I think it's May or June, when the EU was supposed to say, okay, Macedonia, you're either ready or you're not ready to start EU accession talks. All of this is going to have or should have very negative uh, implications for opening up those accession talks. Now, we also know, again, going back to last year when the EU decided to defer this for a year, that they treated both Macedonia and Albania as a package. And to diverge just ever so slightly here, we know what's going on in Albania right now. There's major protests. The opposition in uh, the Albanian parliament didn't just step out of parliament, but I think they gave back their mandates. Yeah. And so everybody is ticked off at Eri Rama uh, and you know, they're calling for for him to step down. Uh, I think a lot, a lot of things are, like this are going on in Bulgaria too, but that's a whole other subject for another time. But anyway, Macedonia and uh, Albania are supposed to, uh, the, the EU is going to take a look at opening up those accession talks come June. 
all of this does not bode well for opening up those accession talks and and again Zayev and his, his uh, government you know said that they were going to take care of all this they were going to restore the rule of law they were going to uh, you know get rid of nepotism they were going to clean up uh, all of the, and those issues existed to one degree or another we need to admit that I think uh, and yet it's getting worse is what's happening actually and there's no way the EU can look at all of these uh, uh, events and say, oh yes, Macedonia is absolutely on the road to uh, uh, you know a strong rule of law and uh, we're going to reward them with opening up accession talks to say nothing of enlargement fatigue, the EU, uh, the elections in May, etc. Um, I'm not sure how Zayev is going to explain that to the Macedonians. Um, we'll see. Yeah, I guess he'll uh, he'll probably use the fact that there will be European elections before the European Council uh, meets on us, and uh, right. depending on how these elections go, uh, if the, if there is a negative decision uh, for Macedonia, and there really should be by any measurable yardstick, uh, which was implied applied before, uh, he, they would probably say, okay, well, this is the EU has taken a turn toward Euroscepticism. At least we got NATO out of all of this, but. Uh, you know, the EU and uh, American diplomats here in the region, they opened a can of worms when they supported people like Zayev. And, you know, there were pre previous examples of arresting leaders in Slovenia and Croatia, always on the conservative side, uh, never on the left. Uh, yep. But they supported Zayev to, uh, you know, deny the outcome of elections, uh, boycott parliament, and then this was drummed up to be like a huge issue. They supported him because he was on the left and uh, people in Brussels uh, like their leftists. And he, would promise, he promised that he would deliver on the name issue, which he did, uh, on the detriment of the Macedonian national interest and sovereignty. But now every other country in the region wants to do the same. And they, everybody can find a European, uh, an American senator or some commissioner who would support them. So now they're doing this in Albania, now they're doing this in Serbia, in Bulgaria. So they, they're, they're doing this twice, again in Bulgaria. It happened once before. So uh, the cat is out of the bag and None of us can expect to complete, you know, to see a, a full four-year term for uh, whichever government, you know, like it or hate it in your country uh, to be completed. We are going to live in permanent political strife and, uh, right. uh, in, you know, infighting. Right. And, and just, uh, again, a slight divergence on, on these topics here. We know that four countries have now ratified uh, Macedonia's uh, NATO accession, mm -hmm. uh, four out of 29. Uh, there's a long way to go. The government is still counting on and telling the Macedonian population that uh, this is going to bring you know peace, sweetness, light, eternal, and unicorn farts uh, to Macedonia uh, and FDI. And that's, you know, that is not going to be the case with NATO. Uh, mm -hmm. at least until it's a full member of NATO, and then even then it takes a long time. Yeah, sure. You add all this into it, and it's it's just a, it's a dark place uh, still, I'm, unfortunately. I'm just looking forward. I believe that the U.S. Senate will vote for this, but I'm just looking forward for the day when Trump uh, hears about this, that another country is trying to join. He did send, send out some letter in which he congratulates Zayef, and I believe, you know, it's clearly not written by him. It, it's one of those things which... No, he doesn't even. No, he didn't even sign. He never saw the letter. That's I know it works. So. So, but yeah, there's going to be a moment when he yeah. talks with Tucker Carlson at some point, and Tucker tells him, "Hey, listen. By the way, do you know that after Montenegro and other countries joining, it's going to be worth you know the outburst. Uh, uh, you know, it's going to be worth seeing this." Uh, but again, afterwards, he's gonna, <laughs> as we say, Ligna na Brashna. He's gonna sign it. I'm, I'm pretty sure. I don't know if Turkey right. or some other country will block this. I doubt it. I think NATO is going to be a done deal. And I hope we do as much damage as possible to the institution once we join. <laughs> but then the EU will be a completely different story. I, I, I mean, listen, yeah. I, I'd love to see a whole NATO summit uh, dedicated to the discussion of the adjectives from the beginning of this podcast. And it's coming. You, everybody knows it's coming. <laughs> of course. Well, and, and by mentioning Trump there, I think you've just given us a nice segue into this next issue I kind of want to talk about. And he's back. Phil Reeker, the former uh, U.S. ambassador. It's alive. It's alive, yeah. The former U.S. ambassador to Macedonia. He's been, uh, he was in Italy and then at NATO, I think. Uh, now he is uh, back. Uh, he is going to be taking the position that uh, Wes Mitchell has just left, 
which is the uh, Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs. So uh, I think we actually have a title now then for our podcast. It's Adjectives, Adverbs, and Ask... <laughs> oh, sorry, no. Adjectives, Adverbs, and Assistants. Um, uh, yeah, that sounds better. Phil, Phil's coming back. Uh, you know, he wasn't good to Macedonia when he was the ambassador there. He won't be good to Macedonia or the region. Uh, he is, uh, he, he's, he's, look, he's, he's part and parcel of the permanent state of the State Department. He's got an agenda and he's going to pursue it. National sovereignty be damned. Yeah. Um, but, uh, we'll, we'll see, we'll see how long he lasts. West Mitchell lasted a year, if even that, um, no, but we'll see how long. Uh, this guy is going to be sneaky. He's going to come in and he's going to pretend that he's like, well, I was appointed by a Republican president to the, what was it then, the spokesman of the State Department, I believe. Or, uh, well, I supported Vumara in the first few years of their term, which were the good few years, but then they became, uh, you know, this undemocratic party, and then I stopped supporting them and I got egg on my face for supporting them. This is what he's going to say. Nobody should buy this. He's obviously. A swamp creature, he does not believe in national sovereignty. This does not represent a Trumpian administration, whatever Trumpian administration was supposed to mean in foreign policy. No conservative, and you know, he's going to be in charge. He was previously in charge of both, uh, you know, Central European countries like uh, Hungary and uh, po Poland, etc. Right. During their swing to the right. And he was visibly upset and clearly ill at ease with th their turn. And, uh, he, but he's going to try and pretend that he's like a real Trumpian ambassador talking against Trump behind his face. But none of this matters. We're never going to get a Trumpian, you know, a really conservative, uh, red-blooded foreign policy from Washington. And no conservative in this region should ever fool him or herself. Uh, there is no uh, friendly face in Washington. We should just uh, consider uh, American foreign <laughs> policy as hostile at this point, uh, which... Is... Well, this, yeah, this this speaks to a larger issue. It's, it's something I've been meaning to write. I've got a couple of half-written articles on it. It's discussions I was having earlier today with some friends on the whole issue of American foreign policy, especially as it relates to Macedonia and the region and Europe, uh, as well as NATO and the EU. And that is, it, it's, it's not really a right or left thing. It's they, They've got this mindset, those that come out of the State Department and other foreign policy wonks, whether they're in uh, the academia, think tanks, media, even culture and entertainment. Uh, they all share a very similar worldview. Uh, they, most of them are atheists or militant atheists. Most of them, uh, you know, believe that they are citizens of the world, quote unquote, whatever that means. Uh, they have a very strong um, uh, motive, motivation in perpetuating all this because their, 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 their pride, their prestige, their power, and certainly their career are all uh, tied to this. And so they have to keep perpetuating the uh, the blob, as it's called, the foreign policy establishment uh, coming out of Washington. So changing that is, you know, that's a whole other subject. And and uh, but it's something worth fighting for. Uh, no, the Trump counter revolution has pursuing. failed, obviously, in, in every way imaginable. In you're that, not in that wall, respect, you're not getting uh, uh, reduction in the uh, state apparatus, let alone the swamp. You're not getting uh, a conservative foreign policy. Uh, Nothing, none, none of this is going to happen. Yeah, uh, this is, again, we're, I want to make sure, you know, we're talking here about foreign policy. We're not necessarily talking about domestic policy because we've had a lot of success with Trump in, regu in uh, getting rid of regulations and in the judiciary, especially because he's doing what he's told to do by the Federalist Society, etc. But anyway, that's far afield from Macedonia. It's going um, to be reversed in the first uh, three weeks of yeah. the Bernie Sanders or Kamala Harris administration. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's a whole other thing. So let's do this. I see uh, want to keep an eye on the clock here. Um, why don't we take another quick break and then come back with our farmer's picks? Sure. ...to publish sensationalist and often false content that caters to Trump supporters. Which brings me to my new segment, Hey, Macedonian Teens! Hey, 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 Macedonian Teens! Knock it off! <laughs> and welcome back to the Macedonian Content Farmers podcast. Jason and Sveten uh, talking about all things Macedonia. 
we are now at the point where we want to reveal our farmer's picks for the week. Svetin, what's yours? Well, I'm going to stay in a similar, similar way in, uh, with uh, what I did last week when I uh, mentioned uh, the Haris Milona's book on uh, how basically uh, North Greece or Aegean Macedonia became Greek, uh, the process <laughs> of... Uh, beating the Greekness into the inhabitants of the region, which were largely Macedonian. Uh, I'm going to go with the classic of this uh, uh, genre, the um, Anastasia Karakasidu book, Fields of Wheat, Hills of Blood, uh, which uh, she's a, an American uh, professor, she's an anthropologist, and she, uh, she went to the villages there and she noticed that uh, basically <clears throat> the region was largely ethnic Macedonian, not Greek. Uh, and... Uh, she was uh, brave enough to write a book about that, which literally nearly got her killed. She had her home address published in the Greek media uh, with an you know, uh, invitation from uh, Greek nationalists to go and get her. Fortunately, she lives and works in the U.S. most of the time. And you know, her book contains passages such as, If Greece exists today as a homogeneous ethnos, she owes this to the Asia Minor catastrophe. This means the expulsion of uh, actual Greek-speaking uh, uh, you know, Christians from uh, modern-day Turkey in, in 1921. If the hundreds of thousands of refugees had not come to Greece, Greek Macedonia would not exist today. The refugees created the national homogeneity of our country, she writes in her book. And, by the way, she acknowledges herself that her family came from Turkey, is not, was not native to Aegean or Greek Macedonia. And uh, there was a very, uh, you know, touching uh, story she told me once, she says that, well, as I would, you know, stay in Solon, live there, and, uh, you know, Thessaloniki, as Greeks call it. And I would have my friends tell me, um, they would say, well, as, uh, you know, we were raised as Greeks, we would speak Greek at home, but as our mothers, fathers, you know, would go into old age and become senile, and they would start speaking Macedonian. And uh, we would ask, well, mommy, what, what, what city do you think you live in? And they would say Solon, not Thessaloniki. And the, the children would be shocked when they would realize that their family is not actually Greek, that they were forced through, throughout their lives to speak Greek, but they were in fact Macedonians, and Macedonians who were forcibly assimilated, and then, that their parents would speak Greek at home to avoid getting into trouble, to avoid getting arrested, but they were in fact Macedonians. And uh, I interviewed her once in uh, maybe like 10 years ago, and she, you know, she told me this story, and it has uh, stuck with me ever since. You know, uh, this is one of the most uh, interesting, uh, most uh, touching stories, I would say, about the name issue. That's, that's an amazing story, mm -hmm. and there's lots of lessons yeah. to learn. Um, my farmer's pick uh, for this week is um, an article from February of 2017. I like finding these these uh, columns, articles, media reports, etc., from the past, and and. Uh, reposting them and then talking about them. Uh, this one is from a, uh, it's called culturetrip.com, uh, top 10 beautiful towns in Macedonia, mm -hmm. Megan O'Hara, no idea who she is, but it uh, doesn't matter. It's, it's uh, the top 10 beautiful towns in Macedonia. She writes, one of the most underestimated destinations in the Balkans, Macedonia, is a nation of ancient cities, beautiful mountains, and lush forestry. The country's location among some of Europe's most stunning mountain ranges, extinct volcanoes, and lakes promises natural beauty and breathtaking landscapes. And then she lists, of course, Ohrid, uh, Berovo, Skopje, uh, Kalichnik, Struga, uh, Stobi, uh, Kratovo, always one of my favorites, mm. uh, Veles, uh, Mavrovo, and Tetovo. And I think those are her top ten. Anyway, we'll put that in the show notes. It is a great reminder of the beauty and the culture and the history and all of the unknowable, uncountable good things that Macedonia has to offer the world. Here, here. Hey, Amen. All right. Well, great. Hey, it's been great talking to you as always. Um, never a dull moment and uh, look forward to talking to you during the week. Yeah, I think the last dull moment was like three years ago. I remember it. Right. <laughs> yeah. All right. Take well, care, you take buddy. care. You too. Bye.